Welcome to our webinar. My name is Tracy Cook with SACS Healthcare Communications. The title of today's webinar is Post-Operative Mastectomy Complications and Care. Speaking today on this very timely topic is Dr. Doreen Gendro. Dr. Gendro is the Clinical Education Specialist, Skin Care Solutions at Medline Industries, Inc. Over the past many years, she has been extensively involved in developing clinical education in various media, including e-learning, webinars, and videos, to name a few. In addition to her skill in creating effective educational programs, Dr. Gendro has been a skin and wound care specialist for over a decade. She has lectured both nationally and internationally on skin and wound care topics. The speaker discloses there are no relevant financial relationships. This activity has been approved for one contact hour of continuing education. At the end of this webinar, you can obtain the, those continuing education credits. The URL will be provided at the conclusion of this webinar. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Dale Medical Products, Inc. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Gendro. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you all for attending our webinar on mastectomy post-op complications. It's a very timely topic, and I hope you find the uh, content relevant and enjoyable. So today, the learning objectives, we're going to do a few things. We're going to describe at least two types of breast cancer treatment modalities, and then we'll look into discussing at least three post-op complications. And ultimately, we'll learn to identify the importance of the use of a surgical bra to mitigate post-op complications. Pause. So we'll start with breast cancer in the United States. The importance of breast cancer and identification of breast cancer um, techniques and diagnostics early on um, is relatively evolved from the very beginning stages. And so we have a plethora of amazing techniques in order to help us screen and to diagnose and to also help us with the prognosis. So let's take a look at the US Breast Cancer Overview. And unfortunately, this is the most common cancer diagnosed for women. And when we see this and look at this, we do understand that 82% occurs most frequently over the age of 50, with breast cancer being the second cause of death after lung cancer in the feminine pop population. And when we look at the disease itself, we recognize that over 41,000 women will die from breast cancer alone. And um, through this process, um, the diagnosis and the journey forward, we'll talk a lot about that as we move through. Um, one third, if you can remember this, one third of the candidates that do have breast cancer diagnosed will have a mastectomy. So when we take a look at the overall statistics and the survivor statistics, these are quite improved over time with the new technologies and the advanced screening techniques. And we see that over 150,000 women are living with metastatic disease. However, we still fo focus and concentrate on that center bullet that says 3.8 million diagnosed, but 41,000 plus women will, will um, pass away from the disease. When we look at the, uh, the, the, the new and the invasive onsets, we see from the year 2019, we've had about 268,000 new cases. And that's pretty significant, but if you can think of that relatively in comparison to five, 10 years ago, that number would have been doubled and tripled even. So how do we identify breast cancer. Again, we talked a little bit about screening, but we also have some really amazing imaging processes to help us diagnose breast cancer earlier. And we do understand the earlier breast cancer is diagnosed, the better the chance for survival is among women. So when we see the breast cancer screening, we understand that factors in age groups, um, it becomes more prevalent in specific groups. So our level of screening and heightened awareness of this testing is important. There are three keys. 
We have self-detection. We understand self-exams, although now um, the research is showing that we might be moving away from that. Um, interestingly enough, this is the easiest one to do at home and can be done frequently. And what I say is um, if you are able to do that self-detection, self-exam and identify something at home, then you're able to, to follow up with your physician and look at further diagnostics. So we're not counting out self-detection and self-examination, but we wanna make sure that we understand that there's a plethora of different um, techniques available. So when we look at the MRI or the breast ultrasound or mammogram, those are the definitive diagnostics and those are um, fantastic imaging systems that um, really hone down and focus in on the type of cancer, the location of cancer, and can actually uh, do well with diagnosing the staging of cancer. Mammograms are, are one of the most familiar diagnostic tools we have for um, diagnosing breast cancer. The benefits are, are that it is identified earliest through mam mammography, and we do have a, um, a lot of information and most insurances now um, for women after a specific age group allow for that as just a regular ordinary wellness visit in order for prevention. Um, there are some risks as always with medical um, uh, interventions and that risk is radiation. There hasn't been much evidence to support that it's a high risk and um, that there are super issues but nonetheless it's all very good to be aware of. With mammography, um, we see the age group where women start moving into that marketplace to get that diagnostic test between the ages of 40 and 54, approximately. It started earlier when they recognized that more and more women increasingly uh, younger ages were coming in with breast cancer in situ. And so the frequency, if you don't have any kind of a risk, if there isn't any genetic predispositioning, they're recommending the, the um, frequency of mammography every two years. But if you do have that moderate to high risk level, then they still are recommending that to be done yearly. So let's take a look at one of the newer imaging procedures. We understand the mammography and that's an older procedure, but this is the DBT or better known as the digital breast tomobosynthesis. And what this is, is as you can see, it's a new imaging procedure. It is a three dimensional image. And some of the pros of this is that it can identify through a dense breast. So for example, younger women um, have considerably more dense breast tissue. So therefore it can really identify um, and detect earlier with signs and symptoms. It's less um, discomfort when you're doing this exam. Um, historically, we are all aware of what happens with the mammography, with the compression of the breast tissue. And so this is a lot um, more comfortable for the women um, who are experiencing it. But again, there are some risks to this as well. And there is a longer exposure to radiation because if you can imagine that 3D imaging um, and they're looking at that X-ray tube arc, it's going to vary from the type of um, images that they want to collect. If this is still relatively new. A lot of physicians might not know about this new technology, specifically in areas that are non um populated and you're looking at more rural and suburban areas versus our cityscapes. And so it's important for us to recognize that there is this type of um, imaging available and to ask for, and if it's not provided by your provider, then to inquire as to where else this is being done within your area. So MRIs, we know about MRIs and we know about ultrasounds and these are used for uh, many different types of disease diagnoses. Where it um, works well with breast cancer is that it is a nice imaging. Um, there is contraindication for certain populations. And again, there are some benefits here um, as it does give a complete comprehensive view of the breast tissue and surroundings. So therefore, if you have a woman who does have uh, breast cancer and then are, they're unsure about the margins and it looks like the tissue is moving um, in surroundings 
surrounding tissue, this is a good um, imaging system to indicate the depth and the breadth of the spread of the tissue involved. However, as we know with all other disease diagnostics, MRIs are um, specifically um, worrisome for those that have psychological phobias or, or anxieties, even the claustrophobic phobic patient, it does take some considerable time and there's a lot of what we call pre-time and post-time and then the actual exam itself. So the indication may suggest both diagnostics. So we utilize this magnetic resuming, uh, resonance imaging or the MRI if in fact the uh, practitioner is not quite um, comfortable with the original results from one of the other uh, initial diagnostics. So we'd use this to just go a little bit deeper and take a look. Um, the ultrasound, again, this is this is fantastic. Not readily available right now. Um, it is less intrusive than the MRI. As you can see that device right there, it's relatively, um, <coughs> excuse me, it's relatively painless. It does have some pressure associated with it, but it is way less intrusive than MRIs. It's less costly, um, and it also improves that breast cancer detection by 35%. Um, what's good about this is that this is an alternative. Again, it might not be available in all areas, but it does, in fact, determine um, more abnormalities within that dense breast tissue. So um, we're talking, we'll talk a little bit about um, biopsy, et cetera, and uh, the ability for the ultrasound to kind of take the place of that in some situations. So we'll talk a little bit about the diagnos nos excuse me, diagnosis and prognosis pieces of that and what that looks like. And here's um, a, a, an amazing um, procedure, and this is the USGBB or the Ultrasound Guided Breast Biopsy. What's amazing about this is they're able to put the biopsy needle in a particular area and this is great to be performed when there's a suspicious mass, if there's some sort of breast tissue distortion, or if there are even abnormal tissue changes. Um, again, if your practitioner believes that further diagnosis is warranted, this is a nice opportunity to give a confirmatory um, type of diagnosis and it's very um, user-friendly, less invasive, then the surgical biopsy, um, and just a nice imaging system. So all of these diagnostics lead up to our ability as practitioners to determine where the breast cancer is in its stage. And we understand that the stage of the breast cancer determines the ability for that um, woman to survive post-treatment. So when we look at determining the stages of breast cancer, we see four stages up there. The first stage being a scale of zero to, to, to four, zero being non-invasive, so remaining in place in situ. And then we have the stage four naturally as being the most invasive, so spreading outside of the breast even into other dish, different tissues. So when we look at that advancement, um, again, this is a progressive staging system and we do understand that the staging is determined by the tissue involved, whether there are nodes involved, and also the movement of the cancer itself beyond the normal breast tissue. We've seen over the last um, eight to nine years, the, um, the movement and the inclusion of the HRS or the hormone receptor status. So now we can identify um, HER2 status or different proteins that the cells are producing to recognize whether or not there's a particular staging or even to the oncotype diagnosis score. Um, it's a hormone related score and that's unique and what that helps us do at an earlier time frame is to determine the stage usually much more quickly, especially if there is a history of breast cancer within the family system. So again, why is this all important? Well, this is all important because early screening, early diagnoses, um, diagnostic testing, that really does enhance the imaging and enhance the ability of the practitioner to see what is happening and occurring within the breast tissue, increases that, that 
woman's chance of survival. So breast cancer prognosis is dependent upon several factors, and we see that. The stage of the breast cancer we know and understand plays a role in the survival, and even the length of survival, the number of years, the longevity of survival. The prognosis increases or improves if the breast cancer is without lymph involvement. So when we see the lymph becoming involved, we understand that there's an increased risk for mortality at a higher rate. When we look at the breast cancer tissue itself and it's metastasized outside of the breast tissue, that's where we see the most um, despairing prognosis, if you will. And of course, the prognosis itself increases with both lymph and metastasis to other tissue involved. As you can see from here, the stage four is what we were just talking about, and the rate of survival is, is minimal. So when we look at this, this figure, it shows the percentage of survival by stage. So in, in situ, you've got about 100% of survival beyond that five-year rate. Stage one, same thing, because we've done a really good job about um, diagnosing and screening early on. Same thing with stage two. Stage three is where we start to move into the lymph involvement and we start to look at what that means for the, the patient with some, some um, lymphatic involvement. And then stage four is when we have both lymph and prognosis um, is poor with the metastasis to other tissues. So when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, what can they do? What types of options and treatment modalities are out there? Well, we understand that there's a, a, a growing number of interventions. So we do have our non-surgical interventions and those are chemo and radiation. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what those are. So chemotherapy, this is the one most closely associated for cancer because it was in fact one of the first methods and mechanisms of cancer treatment. We do understand everybody, um, you know, if we think about our loved ones and we think about our friends and our contacts, I think it we, we all can identify at least one person that has gone through chemotherapy and what effects um, occurred throughout the course of that that treatment. Um, chemotherapy is powerful chemicals. They are non-directive. They are used to kill fast-growing cells, but again, they are not selective in the way that they approach the cancer. They also harm good cells, and many of the cells that they do harm are from the immune system. And new onsets of chemotherapy drugs are improving the um, the, the internal immune fight, if you will, to help combat um, the cancer itself. So we see that chemotherapy is used in combination with other adjunctive therapies, for example, surgical therapies and, and um, radiation and also neoadjunctive therapy to shrink the tumor. So where we focus a beam of light onto a particular area and we eradicate that. So there's a lot of improvement in chemotherapy um, and we've also seen it used in conjunction. The chemo is, is difficult because again, it is powerful chemicals that are used and they do not um, unfortunately um, just kill cancer. So there may be some mild to serious side effects and serious complications and not one practitioner or a physician is able to tell a woman whether or not they will be the ones where this is going to be problematic or this is going to happen. Everybody presumes everyone will lose their hair. There are some women that don't lose their hair. There are some women that don't get sick. So it just depends um, individually on, on the, the person themselves. When we look at radiation, again, this can in fact be used sometimes in combination with the um, the chemotherapy as well as other adjunctive therapies. But this is known, again, for its debilitating, debilitating side effects. Radiation, they come up with a particular formula that gives you um, a number of ions that's going to radiate the skin. And sometimes that causes radiation burns and symptoms may begin within a few weeks of starting this treatment and may end and worsen um, within the first two weeks, um, even post radiation. So it's a continuation. So just 
just like if we were caught in the nuclear fallout, that radiation continues to exist within that environment and the environment here being within our bodies for an extended period of time until it's no longer what we call active. So um, this is an important um, mechanism to know about because right now if you do come out into um, and you have been diagnosed with breast cancer in particular small areas they might only have chemo and radiation therapy as an opportunity for you to help heal um, and to treat. Um, that's why we have cancer therapy centers all over um, the nation right now that um, you know offer additional hope. Some of the short-term effects, as we discussed, there, there is pain. This is managed with um, what we call NSAIDs or, you know, the, the ibuprofen-type products. But it also decreases mobility. It's very, it's very painful. If you can imagine a, a third-degree burn or even a second-degree burn underneath your arm and onto your breast area, it, it's, it's, it's tender. There's sometimes mild redness, topical burns. I've seen that more frequently than not. Also, additionally, the radiation dermatitis where the um, epidermal area becomes very red uh, severely. There's partial skin loss. So it's it's actually a uh, almost like a, a chemical peeling um, reaction that occurs. And again, with chemo and radiation, anytime you have a disease and you're going, undergoing some some treatment of this nature. Fatigue is one of the most significant elements and a decrease in nutrition, uh, you know, just keeping ourselves healthy throughout that period. There are some long-term effects of radiation. Unfortunately, hyperpigmentation, as we saw with the redness, sometimes the melanin that is produced within the epidermal layer of the skin stays and remains, similar to the patient with um, vascular disease where red blood cells are uh, dying at the top in the interstitial spaces. Lymphedema is a significant um, impact um, from radiation and that's where you can see from the pictures themselves the lymph itself is designed to drain all of the um, the processes or the metabolic processes if you will in the body out of the body it, it eliminates toxins and that which we don't want in there anymore um, so if you have uh, damage to that particular system in some areas as the radiation can cause, then you have a sluggish lymphatic system. So it doesn't get rid of or nor eliminate some of the uh, toxins built up. This is the hormone sensitive therapy that has become really popular right now because we recognize it as an awesome opportunity to help the body do what it needs to do. So hormones are those natural substances made by the glands in our body and they're carried throughout our bloodstream. But what's significant to remember about this is they act as messengers between one part of our body and another. So they're the communication um, vehicles. So they are responsible for just about everything within the body and anybody who's had um, fluctuating hormones understands, you know, all the um, variability that hormones can cause. Some cancers use hormones, estrogens, etc., to grow or develop. They are dependent upon these types of hormones. So it's important for us to use medicines. For example, tamoxifen is one that uses um, to the system to block or lower the amount of hormones in the body that really does um, well to slow or um, stop that growth of cancer completely. So we talked about the non-invasive treatment modality types. And so now we're going to move into the invasive treatment modalities where we'll be talking about the surgical um, uh, treatment opp opportunities, treatment interventions. And we'll talk a little bit about breast conserving um, surgery in addition to the mastectomy surgery. So when we look at breast conserving surgeries, it's just that it's a lumpectomy or it's a partial mastectomy so there are pieces or sections of that cancer within the breast tissue that's removed around that lump if there is lymph involvement um, they may in fact remove lymph nodes um, sometimes they will cut beyond that just to identify whether or not the cancer itself is invasive and has gone beyond what we call the margins uh, but know that if 
there is lymph involvement and they're at this stage doing a breast conserving surgery, your chances for moving into um, a full-on mastectomy, a radical mastectomy, um, increase if there's lymph involvement. Usually with this type of um, surgery and surgical intervention, radiation is given post-surgery in addition to sometimes chemotherapy um, in conjunction may also be given in order to stem the flow of um, further um, disease progression. So the other surgical option or surgical intervention, as we said, remember one third of women opt for this because it's as radical as it is, it is um, when women were queried as to why they went with the mastectomy, they felt that they were um, going to quote unquote get rid of it for good. So um, the lumpectomy didn't make them feel like they were taking it away and, and eliminating it completely. So when we look at the mastectomy, there are two kinds. There is simple and there's also modified radical. And you can see as the divided line shows you the tissue itself that is um, extracted and removed from the woman's breast. So you have the lymph node involvement on the one on the left, and that's your simple mastectomy. And you also have that entire section of breast tissue removed surrounding the tumor. And you can see moving into the modified radical, um, radical being the, the one that takes uh, away most of the breast tissue, you're going into the fatty tissue, you're going into the lymph nodes itself, and you're completely removing that entire section. As you can see, the pectoris majoris muscle underneath that, you can understand when we talk a little bit about the reconstructive surgery and why it's important to uh, for the surgeon who's doing this to do a really good job and to be very cautious on how they are cutting tissue, where are they cutting? Where are they leaving their margins? And finally, with the, the closure of that tissue. So with Angelina Jolie coming out, you know, a few years back now, looking at the BCA, um, which is looking at breast cancer within the genetic testing system, um, more and more women who have that maternal family diagnosis, um, earlier usually than 50 years old, are women that are opting to have what we call the BRC1 and the BRC2 test to determine whether or not they are in fact have that gene, have that risk, and then they might in fact consider having a prophylactic mastectomy. Um, this is something that occurs when um, there's dense breasts involved or if they've already undergone radiation therapy to their chest, you know, uh, when they were younger than 30 years old. And if they have what's considered, if they have a mammography that shows microcalcifications uh, within the breast tissue, they might in fact opt to prophylactically remove full well knowing that the microcalcification sometimes leads over to breast cancer. So once a woman has a mastectomy, what can be done. So more and more insight and expertise is going into the area of reconstruction surgery. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You can have implant reconstructions, and this is one of the two techniques um, relatively used. So we have implants that are inserted. They are either filled with saline or gel. They are easier on the front end, which means while we are undergoing mastectomy, we are able to do the implant reconstruction immediately thereafter. One of the benefits of that is the woman will wake up from surgery and she will have what she feels are breasts remaining. So there is some um, psychological impact um, with respect to doing this immediately um, post mastectomy. And many women do opt for that. Um, if they opt to delay that a little bit, we have the ability to put spacers in between so that way they're in future state once the wounding of the um, surgery is complete um, and healed a little more, we're able to do that. But again, sometimes this is um, delayed healing and this could cause some interesting challenges uh, postoperatively. 
So when we talked a little bit about when we showed that picture of the mastectomy and the, the muscle underneath, as you can see from left to right, this is a reconstruction. This is um, the larger of the two methods and it's the, the most um, invasive of the two. And as you can see, it involves uh, removal of the abdominal muscle and then reinserting um, from the interior up into and coming out of the breast itself. So the abdominal um, panel is, is worked on and the muscle is rerouted up at the top. Sometimes a thigh or the back is, is utilized and that would depend upon um, the patient. This does allow a lot more time for recovery as you can well imagine. There are um, drains that are placed here. The surgical incision is longer. As you can well imagine, this is painful and the recovery time, like any large um, body surgery, is extended because of that. Um, does come with a full um, compendium of post-op complications from infections to um, dehiscence, et cetera. But we recognize that the flap reconstruction does in fact um, offer a longer recovery time and it does perform better over time uh, versus the implants. And many women opt for this methodology because they're able to say um, once this is done, they've got um, what feels like physiologic breast, they feel like it's it's their own because it's an autologous um, flap reconstruction, it's using their own tissue. And so it performs better over time. And psychologically, it, it also helps to know that you're not implanting foreign objects within your body. So some women opt for that. And as we talked about, there are always post-op complications. And so we need to be mindful of that when we go in. So um, one of the important things we need to remember before we talk about swelling and lymphedema is that Prior to surgery, it's super important for anyone, um, not just women who are experiencing breast cancer and opting for mastectomy, but it's important for anyone undergoing surgery to what we call fortify or, or neutrify their bodies before going into surgery. So for, you know, if you've got a uh, surgery scheduled a month out, that entire month do really, really good things to your body, eat well, sleep well, drink plenty of fluids, um, et cetera, take your vitamins, minerals, nutrients. Um, this helps your body um, to heal much more quickly. And women that do that, they find they have a better, um, prognosis, if you will, um, thereafter. So um, one of the uh, impacts, and we talked a little bit about lymphedema, um, but post mastectomy, as you can well imagine, we're, especially when we're moving into the lymph nodes, we're looking at possibility of the lymphatic system being damaged and the lymph backing up. And this is, it's, it's really painful and it's very, very difficult um, to treat once it becomes um, a, a, a huge problem. And this, when you think of breast cancer and you think of the diagnosis and you think of the disease and you think of the treatment path, and then this occurs, this is actually impacting a piece of that immune system. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we are impacting that system by which we want to fortify. So it does impact that future state for the, for the uh, patient itself. And unfortunately, the, the fluid starts to back up, the tissue can't handle it, and it starts to break open, it becomes weepy, backs up into the system. So it's really not an ideal state. Seromas may uh, form as well as hematomas, and those are just as they sound. A seroma is a fluid uh, vessel collected underneath the skin of the tissue itself. And as with any surgery, large irrigation is used, so that pocket of collection of fluid is something that occurs most frequently. But also, additionally, hematomas are, are also um, 
being collected or may form. Again, you know, if we're cutting into someone and we're surgically um, assisting them or treating them, then um, the patient is bleeding. So there's opportunities for the body to do what it does best and form little pockets around um, fluid and blood that they believe should not be there and it just takes care of it. And what happens if it's nice and small, the body just goes ahead and absorbs it. Um, most post-op mastectomies have drains placed in um, in order to be able to continue to drain um, the, the, the serous fluid and the blood um, from that particular area in order to avoid these types of complications. One of the other things that can occur um, post-mastectomy is the post-mastectomy pain syndrome. And 20 to 30 percent of women um, have this or report these findings. And I believe there's there's probably a little bit more um, who are just living and dealing with it. Women are so good at doing that, are we not? But they have this unrelenting neuropathic pain in chest wall. And if you imagine someone that does have an amputation of a particular limb who report that phantom type of pain, this is ideal. This is this is uh, uh, similar to that particular situation. So there's pain and tingling in the chest wall, the nerves, if you can imagine, as we said, everything is innervated. So the nerves are trying to communicate. They're not finding their end point. So there's this tingling going on. There could be pain in the surgical scar. And then also radiculopathy or pain that crawls along that arm down into the, the, the fingers, um, et cetera. And a lot of women have reported unbearable itching. So again, if you think about the neurological impact of, of having tissue been removed where there once was an, an ability for the neurological system to communicate, we can understand why. Another one of these um, byproducts or complications is the uh, frozen shoulder syndrome. So there's swelling within the articular shoulder capsule that does in fact restrict your movement. But this also increases um, the risk of mobility, immobility and pain postoperatively. And when we see the, um, the, the shoulder freezing up because of that pain, what ends up happening, and this is why the exercises post mastectomy are begun immediately after surgery, um, similar to if you have knee or joint surgery, um, is to start that joint or that area to recognize that, yes, I still need free range of motion and please do not stiffen up on me because the body is very kind to us. It's going to um, compensatorily do what it believes we need it to. So ranges of physical therapy, stretching exercises, that all helps to um, to ward that off. One of the best benefits is wearing the surgical bra to mitigate the complications. And we talked about a, a, a few things. If you look at the ability of the body to start forming seroma or, or hematoma, or even that joint pain or that syndrome of pain, the breast cancer syndrome, a lot of this can help to mitigate. I mean, how many of us has put a warm compress on something or a nice dressing or wrapped uh, you know, a limb that has been harmed up and felt comfort from that. And, you know, much of the, the mitigation of those pains or post-op complications um, can be found in that, again, that neurological communication. Um, if it's comfortable, it's comforting, the body starts to relax a little bit more, offers a beautiful sense of security and comfort for the woman postoperatively. One of the benefits is when we see that, it might decrease that lymphedema development. If you can imagine, um, if you have a huge balloon and all of a sudden you lymphedema is kind of like you section off that balloon and tie that little band in the middle, and then you have two areas um, with, a, with a tied area done in the center. Um, similarly, if you keep that flow and you don't tie, if you will, or, or compress that um, area, you're going to be able to um, keep everything 
flowing in the direction it's supposed to be flowing. And as I said, this can in fact assist with seroma or hematoma development and even management of that. So think of the smaller seromas or hematomas that can be absorbed by the body. This just helps apply that um, uh, soft, um, I guess a therapeutic intervention is what I want to call it because it holds it in. Can you imagine um, what it feels like? And some of you might imagine what it feels like um, postoperatively to have um, the surgery and the comfort and level of security that this can provide to you. So we talked a lot about the physiologic effects of breast cancer and um, some of the treatments, but think about the journey of the breast cancer patient now. The breast cancer patient goes through the diagnostics, which is um, something to gain anxiety about, the worry about, am I going to survive this? I'm going to have to have surgery, I'll have to have chemo, I'll have to have radiation. And then ultimately they go and they choose the mastectomy. And there's still post um, mastectomy psychosocial effects that occur with that. So even though we look at and we can visibly see that the patient um, can take a sigh of relief and say, well, they've got it out. Um, in their own quiet moments, they are still processing what this feels like to them as a woman and as a mother, as a wife, as, you know, a member of society and what this looks like. And, you know, we live in um, a society that focuses on and identifies women's breast as our identity. And there seems to be a lot of self-esteem that is wrapped up and tied up in this particular area. So if you can imagine, the, especially the younger women that are, that are having this um, intervention, they're struggling with their self-esteem. You know, many women have in fact um, come through and they're in that warriors club, um, but there are many that do not, many that are primed for depression and anxiety, even going into it, you know, going through that entire extensive journey and coming to this place where now they, are feeling that they are less than uh, they were before. And what contributes to that as well is that obvious physical change from the loss of the breast. And this is why most women who choose that, um, you know, the, the implant therapy right after the mastectomy, um, this is something that they're trying to mitigate or avoid. They don't want to see their body in this, um, in this way. They feel that something is missing. And, you know, the, the scarring and the way the chest appears is determined upon exactly what tissue was involved. And as you can imagine, the radical mastectomy, in fact, removes most of the breast tissue that is there. Many women do report feeling inadequate. They report um, feelings that they don't feel loved or they've had issues with their partners or even they've reported that they feel like they've lost their sexuality or their femininity and many have um, entered into therapy post-operatively in order to be able to deal with these mechanisms. So ultimately when we talk about breast cancer it's not just a diagnosis and a treatment. It is an actual lifetime journey. And for many women, it's, it's fraught with um, anxiety, depression, worry, um, internal communications with themselves. And it's important for us when we choose um, this, this treatment path to feel like we are being supported. And I think we're doing such a better job of that um, these days than we did before. Again, like many topics, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, were very taboo, especially women's breasts. Now we're able to identify that this is truly a walk. This is a journey. And these women um, experience different levels of roller coasters on this diagnosis to healing. And so for us to offer that emotional support through the, the you know, understanding them, listening actively, um, 
most of us love, you know, especially we nurses, we love to um, come up with a solution for things, many times supporting the survivor, um, especially when we're nurses and we have family members even, um, we go into that default mode of trying to fix um, the patient. And many women have said, I just want someone to listen to me, to hear me, to let me know um, that I am still who I am and to recognize, you know, the beauty that I am still in their lives. So try as we might to fix them, oftentimes it's, it's, it's just something that we need to pay attention to, listen to them, talk honestly with them. Um, if, if they're not able to do that, then don't force them to talk about it. Um, continue to um, emotionally support them and um, actively listen and be present to them. So in conclusion, when we look at breast cancer statistics, we see that they are declining, but they do remain one of the most debilitating diagnoses. And we've walked through that path and we've walked through that woman's journey and we've seen why this can in fact be a debilitating diagnosis. We understand that many diagnostics are still in place to better identify breast cancer, even increasingly more early and more accurately. But we still see, unfortunately, chemo and radiation widely being used as the primary modalities um, with those associated negative side effects. And, you know, they're, they're not cure-all. Sometimes cancers may reoccur. And sometimes you have a, a woman choosing chemo and radiation as that path with their physician and they um, have to, in fact, have a surgical intervention post-operatively, uh, post-decision. Um, Many re women do require that surgical in intervention in the form of a lumpectomy or mastectomy. Remember the staging diagnoses um, of breast cancer will in fact determine which is the best course of treatment um, for the best option of um, increased survival rate. But we also understand that if surgical interventions are chosen or that's the path they're directed towards, that women that do undergo surgery may face many post-op complications, both psychological and physiological, um, and it's up to us to um, support them throughout this process um, in any way we can. We've seen that the use of surgical bra can assist to mitigate these circumstances, um, increasing that level of comfort and that support um, to help absorb um, some small seromas and hematomas. And it may serve her throughout that breast cancer journey. So even the use of a surgical bra during that diagnostics or an initial treatment um, from chemo and radiation would in fact assist um, throughout this um, journey in order to make that more comfortable um, to the woman. And ultimately, you know, we need to seek to support women, as we saw. They, they're experiencing this disease, and as we know how we are so connected to who we are through what we look like these days especially, we need to um, just be there with love and support and understanding for our loved ones. Um, as they go through this journey itself. So I'm going to end there and I'm going to turn it over to Tracy in order to be able to have her talk to you about the continuing education or the CE activity for the nurses. So we thank you for your time. We thank you for listening. And we hope you found this helpful. Thank Tracy. you, Doreen, for... Thank you, Doreen, for a most informative session. And I'd now like to inform our viewers on how to obtain their CEs for this session. This activity has been approved for one contact hour. You can obtain those continuing education credits by logging on to saxtexting.com backslash P. You will need to register on the test site, complete the evaluation form, and post test. Upon successful submission, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. And this activity is supported by an education grant from Dell Medical Products, Inc. We'd like to thank you all for attending today's session.